Welcome to episode 85 of Fascinating, a Star Trek podcast. Star Trek V, The Final Frontier. In this week's movie, the crew of the new Enterprise A must respond to news of hostages taken on the planet of galactic peace. Arriving rapidly, Kirk and Co. discover that all is not as it seems, as an organised force captures the ship and sets course for the centre of the galaxy. With Klingons in stealthy pursuit, can Kirk regain control in time to save his ship, or is this one frontier too far? Bourbon and beans, an explosive combination. Take Spock and handle it. Are you kidding? With that Vulcan metabolism, he could eat a bowl of termites and it wouldn't bother. <laughs> Good evening, Ian. How you doing? I'm not too bad, Jay, especially after those uh, beans earlier. But not the bourbon. Not yet. Wait till I get home. Yeah, I can tell. You can. Mm-hmm. It's the sort of poor poisoning motion on the seat. Nope. It's the smell. Oh. Oh, well. Did you enjoy this movie? It's widely regarded as the worst. I don't think it was terrible. I enjoyed it, to be I, honest. <laughs> yeah. I have to say, I thought it was certainly better than the first one. Sure. And there are deficiencies, but, you know, the production ran out of money, and you can see that in the, some of the special effects and things like that. But right. There's, there's stories and reasons for it all. I don't think it's necessarily as bad as it's been made out. I think the story's okay. Mm, yeah, story's fine. It's not that far off some of the regular episodes that you had. In fact, I would say it's a spiritual successor, if not an actual successor, to The Way to Eden. Uh, Remember the episode with the hippies? Yeah, yeah. It's the same idea. Just a different group looking for the same place. Yeah. We discussed last week uh, the comedy elements in the, in the movies, and I think we both agreed that they pretty much nailed it. They got it just right last week. I thought this week they may have slightly... St- stepped over the, the the mark into buffoonery and almost slapstick yeah i think the problem with this one is a lot of the humor was added to the original story like they came up with the story and then they were told to make it funnier so were they yeah by who the studio who enjoyed the previous film right they thought that's the way it must be from now on mm. but it's not really a funny story it's not it's not the same opportunity it's more of a a moral tale you know or an emotional tale We've also discussed in the past a, a, a lack of, of threat. I think this one, there's, there's no threat at all, is there, really? Well, until the final act. Yes. The, the, until you get there, you're The watching. main antagonist isn't really an antagonist. He's more of sort of a, um, I don't even know what the right word would be, rival, I guess, something along those lines. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you never felt as if he was going to... Cause harm, yeah. yeah. No, I, I agree. Well, before we get into social accounts as usual... Yep at trek podcast on facebook twitter and instagram we are at a star trek podcast.com if you want to see one of the posts we put up for each episode where you can leave comments and discuss the show or if you prefer to listen on youtube we are available there also okay shall we get into this let's crack on a handy cry on on the screen tells us that we're on nimbus three in the neutral zone the planet of galactic peace. It's not explained at this stage. No. It's a windy, desert-like planet. We see a man. A bald man. Very much so. Struggle to turn what looks like a key into the ground before picking up a gun in panic as a cloaked horseman approaches and the dry ground beneath his feet starts to crack. Did you see what he loaded his weapon with? No, what? It was just small rocks from the ground. Well, they can do some damage. So it's a kind of a futuristic looking weapon, but obviously without any of the required projectiles. Yeah, it's got a touch of the post-apocalyptic, the, the Mad Max. Mad Max, yeah, that sort of thing, yep. What year was this? 1989? Yes. Yeah, so the, the Mad Max movies have been out for a while, two or three of them by sure. this point. The man, he dismounts and notes that he thought weapons were forbidden and doesn't think that this guy will kill him for a, a field of empty holes. But the man says this is all that he has. He then falls, to the, the, the ball chap, he then falls to his knees as the other offers to explore his pain 
and we'll drag him into the uh, drag him from the darkness into the light. So quite a, a bold introduction. It is. So the this sort of process, whatever it is, takes place, and the bald man asks this other guy, "Where did he get this power?" He feels as if a weight has been lifted from his heart, and the, the horseman he walks away. And is asked how he can be repaid. What does he tell him? He says he can join his quest to seek the ultimate knowledge. And this apparently is going to require a, a starship. And he's uh, he's got a way to, to bring one. He does. He pulls back his hood and reveals he's a Vulcan man. And he says there are more of them than you know. And they both smile and laugh like they only do in the movies. Yes, and then we get the opening credits and we hear the theme tune from the first movie. Right. Yeah, when we did the podcast from the first movie, I said I thought they continued with that all the way through. That was obviously wrong because in the second, third, and fourth movies, they had James Horner's music. Yeah, don't do it again, Ian. And I don't think they use it in the sixth film. I'm not going to commit to that. No, don't. But After they, that, they were already using it in the next generation by the time this movie came out. Right. Okay. You've redeemed yourself, but you made yourself look a bit of a fool. Well, for two seconds, nobody even was paying attention. Yeah. We then find ourselves at Yosemite National Park. Star date 84, 54.1. A man is free climbing. It's an incredible physical feat and he's doing it with some snazzy yellow striped trousers. Yeah, I've noted it's possibly the most ridiculous scene ever in Star Trek. Well, you know for a fact that as director and uh, story creator William Shatner insisted that Kirk have a feat of physical prowess at the start of the movie. Even 20 years ago, in his prime, Shatner, Kirk would never have been capable of doing this. He was never strong and, and, and th these guys, the physical perfection you need to, to attain to do this sort of uh, climbing, no chance. It is at least making him sweat. Yeah, it's probably just the heat, the sun. Not the effort. To Not the effort the at all, no. McCoy is watching with some kind of futuristic tech by binoculars and uh, mocking the assurances that Kirk gave him that he'd be able to relax whilst he was here on holiday. <laughs> yeah, he's also watching in some uh, nice denim. Indeed, he looks very uh, country. Yeah. Back up in the rock, Kirk is in enjoying the now uh, near top view, but almost falls in fright when Spock appears. Yes, he's wearing some kind of jet boots. Yeah, hover boots. Yeah, it would have been much easier just to use those in the first place. He warns him about the danger of the situation, but understandably, Kirk doesn't want this advice and tells him to go and pester McCoy instead. Spock points out McCoy's not in the best mood for chatting right now and Kirk falls. Yeah, because of the advice being uh, bestowed upon him by Spock. Yeah he's, yeah, he's in a position where he really needs to be concentrating on what he's doing and not chatting to one of his friends. And he plummets head first to the ground. Yes, Spock races after him in his jet boots. With the help of some uh, yeah, dubious special effects. Well, all the special effects are dubious. We can explain that when we get to the trivia. Okay. And he does save him right at the end although you would think the rapid deceleration would have some sort of negative effect yeah eyeballs being um yeah he would stop but his innards would come out his mouth yeah. or something but no he's fine and then weiss cracks to mccoy about dropping in for some dinner and this is the first taste we have of the the, the humor they're trying to inject here the yeah i suppose it's 80s now so you watch snigger and what have you as well the, the one-liners were very much in, in vogue indeed we skip back to Nimbus 3, where Paradise City from the Guns N' Roses song... Well, I was going to say, yeah, I was expecting <laughs> Axel to be hanging around. <laughs> now, at this time, um, yeah, so this movie was made in 89. I believe that the, the track was recorded a few years earlier, but not didn't gain traction until about uh, 89 itself, so... Ah, that's probably because of this. Yeah, a massive hit. They should have used it. I think, actually, I suppose at this time, Guns N' Roses were probably the, the biggest band in the, in the world. Well, one of. Yeah. They were Queen. Not 1980. Guns N' Roses far bigger than Queen at this point. Anyhow, we go to a bar, sort of Star Wars-y Another one, bar, yes. And we meet a three-breasted cat lady. A bit like... Uh, Total Recall. Total Recall, yeah. yeah. And there's a woman, I think, serving drinks, although she looks like she's also enjoying a drink herself. And then a man or a woman in a hood arrives. I think it's quite obvious it's a, a, a the female form. She enters and is nodded to the back room by this barkeep. She removes her cloak and reveals herself to be a female Romulan. Who introduces herself as, is it Caitlin Dar? Kathleen Dar. Kathleen Dar to two people already there. Yes, St. John Talbot. St. John? St. John, is that what you're calling him? Oh, well, St. John is, uh, St. John is often shortened. shortened to St. John. Why would you call him St. John? 
Uh-huh. Like, it was a first name. Anyway, he reminded me a bit of the, if you ever watched The West Wing, the English ambassador. Right. They? Anyway, there's also a Klingon called Cord, who looks like a Klingon Father Jack. Yes, he's the, the, the Federation rep, or, or all three are Federation no, reps. St. John is the Federation rep, the Klingon is a Klingon rep, ah, yeah, and the sure. Romulan is a Romulan rep. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, the Klingon belches and doesn't say very much. Uh, and meanwhile, we get a look outside the city where the, the bald man, the Vulcan, and a band of followers are approaching. A ragtag group. Kathleen talks about the history of Nimbus 3. It's a bit of um, exposition for us. Yeah. So it's a settlement that was being developed together by these three major powers to show that they could work hand in hand, but the dream died quickly because the only folk they could get to settle there were the dregs of the galaxy. Yeah, who they conned into yes. turning up. So they, they, they quickly started infighting and uh, even though weapons were banned, they made homemade yes. gear. Yeah. As we saw earlier on. Yeah. Dar, she claims to have arrived just in time as a, a warning klaxon is sounded. Yes, and these three emerge to see bands of raiders entering the city and the Vulcan on horseback. Yes, and also the, the baldy fella. Well, he's in there somewhere. Yeah. Back inside, Dar and Sinjin attempt to get to the transmitter whilst the Romulan goes for a drink, but they are stopped by the Vulcan. No, the Klingon goes for the drink. Is it Klingon? Yeah. Oh, whatever, one of them. But in, in any case, the Vulcan tells them they are now all prisoners and they say they're already prisoners on this rock but there's not really much you can threaten them with yeah and he wonders why you know what's the point that's a worthless planet what's your yes and the romulan says their governments will stop at nothing to protect them which is what he's hoping for yeah we find that out yeah well he says it we then have a, a scotty report yeah the enterprise in stardock is our starbase whatever it is is being fixed up a little bit there's a lot of things that don't quite work and he's doing a bit of moaning about this, obviously, this snagging. This happens quite a lot through the movie. Scotty complaining about things not working. Oh, yeah. It's his job to fix them. Exactly. On the bridge. Well, before that, Uhura shows up. She brings him some food. Yeah, some space dinner. So that's on the bridge, is it not? Is it? Well, wherever he's working, yes. Yes, he's under a panel on the bridge, isn't he? Yeah. And she's visibly a bit older and greyer. Yeah, which makes a, a scene that's coming up all the more uncomfortable but i can oh, we'll get to that we can chat about that when we get there yeah anyhow before they get a chance to eat a distorted red alert comes through from starfleet with a priority seven situation in the neutral zone and this isn't how red alerts work is it not someone on the ship has to call red alert. you don't get a remotely operated red alert yeah, maybe now you're doing maybe the new ship has that facility it's a high priority message and then the captain should be making a decision she whether to go to red alert okay she tries to explain that they have no crew and the ship is not ready but the communication is clear. She has to stand by and recall all key personnel. Indeed. So we go to where Sulu and Chekhov, I think it was meant to be Mount Rushmore, but the special effects didn't work out so okay. well. And again, this is again a bit more of the, the sort of near slapstick humour. Yeah, or... these two are portrayed as idiots. They're lost in a wood. Mm-hmm. And when they try to pretend that it's due to the weather, Chekhov starts blowing in the communicators. Mm. Like, oh. Anyway, who knows? exactly what's going on but tell them she'll keep their secret safe and send a shuttle for them a little later mccoy kirk and spock are eating at the campfire where mccoy warns spock not to insult his uh, family bean recipe yeah we heard at the top of the podcast the remarks he makes about the bourbon and beans and spock's intestinal fortitude yeah obviously it reminds me of a nod here to blazing saddles i've not seen blazing Saddles. you need to watch blazing saddles i don't like westerns oh shut up Anyway, uh, Kirk and McCoy share the bourbon directly, not just through the beans. Yes. Uh, and uh, before yeah, McCoy uh, has a go at Kirk for being reckless, which causes him to open up a little to his friends. You know, you two could drive a man to drink. Me? What did I do? What did you do? You really piss me off, Jim. Human life is far too precious to risk on crazy stunts. Maybe it didn't cross that macho mind of yours, but you should have been killed when you fell off that mountain. It crossed my mind. And? And even as I fell, I knew I wouldn't die. Oh, I thought he was the only one who's immortal. Oh, no, it isn't that. I knew I wouldn't die because the two of you were with me. I do not understand. I've always known. I'll die alone. Well, 
call Valhalla and have them reserve a room for you. This mystery to me what draws us together, all that time and space, and we're getting on each other's nerves. And what do we do when Shirley comes along? We spend it together. Other people have families. Other people don't, it's not us. What are you doing? I'm preparing to toast a marshmallow. Oh, I'll be there. A marshmallow. Where'd you learn to do that? Before leaving the ship, I consulted the computer library to familiarize myself with the customs associated with camping out. Well, tell me, Spock, what do we do after we toast the Marsha Marshmallow? Marshmallow, are you uh, happy enough with that? Well, there's an explanation for that in the novelization. Okay. Yeah, apparently, as a prank, uh, McCoy changed every reference to marshmallows in the ship's computer to marshmallow so that when Spock did his research, he would get it wrong. Right. It's not that funny. No. To be honest. It's not. I don't know if Leonard and I just can't say marshmallow. Maybe. Kirk and McCoy then try and get some circular uh, row, row, row your boat singing on the go, but Spock, as expected, doesn't understand the concept, which of course irks McCoy and Kirk calls it a night. Yeah. <laughs> McCoy says you just sing to have a good time and Spock says oh I'm sorry Doctor were we having a good time? <laughs> That's one of my favourite lines actually in the movie. Sure. We cut to a little later where Spock notes um, life is uh, not a dream and it's told to go to sleep by, by Kirk. He is. Meanwhile up in space a Klingon bird of prey decloaks near a human probe. Yeah. Although look, before we get there I did quite like their uh, Walton-esque good nights. <laughs> yes, to each all other. the way around, yeah. Yeah, yeah so they, yeah, they've decloaked near a, a satellite and their very aggressive looking captain enters the bridge and then proceeds to blast it to pieces. My understanding is it was based on maybe Pioneer 10, which was launched in the 70s and was last heard from having left our galaxy in 2003 when the batteries ran out on its communications unit. Rough. But it's headed for the next star. It'll get there in two million years. We'll be old, old men by that point. Yeah, we will. Mm -hmm. Probably heads in a jar. They then receive a, a video communication which sends them off towards Nebulous 3. Nimbus 3. That's what I said. Most of their communication seems to be intercepted. There's nobody who seems to talk directly to the Klingons. I think in this case maybe they do. Yeah. But later on it's all overheard or hijacked. Back in Yosemite. The guys are abruptly awoken by a shuttlecraft. Well, there's this big bright light. It reminded me, was it Close Encounters? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, it's hovering over them and uh, hitting them with a, a spotlight. Uhura apologises for the transporter not working and points out she couldn't call ahead because they didn't take their communicators. Well, all four of them. Well, Kirk certainly didn't. They don't really talk about the others. Perhaps they deliberately forgot so they wouldn't be interrupted. Indeed. In any case, she's come with an urgent message from Starfleet. Yes, but Kirk has an environmental message of his own. What's that? Telling the other two to pick up their trash before they leave. Yeah, leave it as you found it. Yep. Leave no, what is it, leave no, no sign, sign effectively. Yeah. Yeah. There's a nice shot of the Enterprise in front of the moon as they travel in this craft. And Spock m corrects McCoy on his misquoting of Macefield. Indeed. But McCoy points out that if Spock is so well versed in the classics, how come he doesn't know row, row, row your boat? Well, the answer to that would be it's not a classic. Not a classic. Yeah. <laughs> the shuttle docks in the Enterprise's shuttle bay, and we see it's named Galileo, presumably a yeah. new version of the old one because a new design of shuttlecraft, I think. They are immediately met by the still moaning Scotty, who complains that he had too much time, and that's why the, the ship is still not ready. That makes no sense. It doesn't. No. In the turbo lift on their way to the bridge, Kirk notes that he needs a shower and Spock agrees. Yeah, they have to uh, squeeze through a defective door to get into the lift. Uh, more so when they come out of the lift yeah. at the bridge. Kirk hands his um, checked shirt to, I think it's his daughter. Is it? Yeah, or wife, one or the other. I can't remember. Okay. Um, and there's meant to, that was meant to be a joke. 
Right. She just stands there holding it for the rest of the scene because there's no coat hooks in a bridge. Okay. But I don't think anyone really picked up on that much. On the bridge, Kirk asked for some quiet. You know, I think there's a lot of people still working around about him as uh, Starfleet is put on the viewer. Could we hear Bob tell him about the trouble on Nimbus 3? Yes, good old Bob. Bob? Um, he comments on Kirk's casual attire. I think he's wearing a t-shirt that says, Go climb a rock. Okay. And... Kirk explains that there's problems with the Enterprise and is there no other ship in a better position? He's told that there are other ships in a better position, but there's no other experienced commanders like him, and he wants him to take on this mission. I don't understand why uh, Kirk and the Enterprise, they're explorers, they're just there reporting. They're not the type of... They're not hostage negotiators. Well, have we ever seen Kirk do any hostage negotiation before? Not really, no. I can't remember any. No. But again, it's just not his... They're not um, military, as it were. Well. No, they're not front line. They're not. They shouldn't be. Yeah, they, I mean, he's killed a lot of people, of course. Mainly his own men. Well. But um, they're not fighters. No, that's true. In any case, they're told about the terrorists who have captured the settlement and taken the Klingon, Romulan and Federation consuls hostage. Yes, they're also, they're also warned to watch out for the Klingons when they get there. And McCoy points out to Kirk that the Klingons aren't very fond of him. That's true. What's their uh, what's their mission? Well, they have to rescue the hostages and take control back of Nimbus Three, I guess. A bit like Chuck Norris and Delta Force. Very similar. Yeah. Scotty says that the ship will get there, no matter what, even if he has to get out and push. And Kirk reflects that the the new chair is not as good as his old chair. Huh. On the Klingon bridge, the female what position is she? Well, I think executive officer. I just went with that. Okay. She speaks in Klingon, but it appears that, how I interpret it, that they know that Kirk is on his way and they've got plans for him. Well, yes, the captain thinks that defeating Kirk would make him the greatest warrior in the galaxy. Or that's what he's told. Yeah. Captain's log. 84... Well, <laughs> not much of a captain's log, is it? The log is gobbed. Yeah, this is as close as we get to a captain's log anyway. The log recording device is broken, so they move on. <laughs> on the screen... The hostage information is shown from Starfleet and Kirk can't believe Kord is one of them until Spock explains that he has apparently fallen out of favour with the Klingon High Command. Well, we saw this before, was it in one of the first Klingon episodes when they were on the planet with yep. the two um, sides both wanting the control of the planet and they, I think it was a core mm. said that the assignment as governor of this planet was the kind of job you get when you failed. Ah, yeah, uh, it's something more military. Yeah, sure. The tape is played, and we hear Dar confirm that they have surrendered to the Galactic Light Army, and that they demand a starship in return for their release. Yes, we then get a close-up of the Vulcan man, who says he regrets the necessity of these desperate acts, but urges them not to test him. They need a Federation starship, and Spock has an odd reaction. What's that? Well, he turns to his computer and gets a close-up of this guy's face and Kirk comes over and tells me he looks like he's seen a ghost mm. which Spock says he may well have done yeah I think we might be in the the lounge next. forward observation lounge we learn later on is it okay in any case the room is darkened and Kirk and McCoy enter to find Spock alone and contemplating who he just saw Spock what is it do you know this Vulcan? I cannot be certain. But he does seem familiar. He reminds me of someone I knew in my youth. Why, Spock, I didn't know you had one. I do not often think of the past. Who is it he reminds you of? There was a young student, exceptionally gifted, possessing a great intelligence. It was assumed that one day he would take his place amongst the great scholars of Vulcan. But he was a revolutionary. What do you mean? The knowledge and experience he sought were forbidden by Vulcan belief. Forbidden? He rejected his logical upbringing and embraced the animal passions of our ancestors. Why? He believed the key to self-knowledge was emotion, not logic. Imagine that, a passionate Vulcan. 
When he encouraged others to follow him, he was banished from Vulcan, never to return. Fascinating. Captain to the bridge. On my way. Don't you think it was a bit odd that after Spock describing this person, no one asked, well, what's his name? Who is it? Yeah, tell me more. Why'd you care? Yeah. Anyway, up on the bridge, there's a call coming in from Paradise City, but Kirk says to respond with only static, stalling for time, I guess. Yeah, and from engineering, Scotty confirms that they are still not in a position to beam up the hostages, and Kirk notes that they'll just have to rescue them the good old-fashioned way. Meanwhile, Spock reports there's a Klingon vessel incoming with weapons primed. Yeah, in two hours they will be within uh, range of these weapons. Yeah, why have they got their weapons primed when they're two hours away? Anyway. Always be prepared. So <laughs> <laughs> the Boy Scouts. So on the shuttlecraft, along with a, a team of security, they get... Um, oh. So, along with a team of security, they get into a shuttlecraft. These are Starfleet Marines. Are they? Yes. yes. And Spock recommends landing quite far away from Paradise This City. reminds me of Bread and Circuses. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Kirk complains. It's an awfully, far, awfully long walk. <laughs> and also in the Apple, this happened as well, didn't it? They had to hike. Yeah. So we're at the, the headquarters. Yes, so the Vulcan is now talking to the Enterprise... And yeah, captain Chekhov. Chekhov's posing as the captain, yes. Would he not be the actual captain anyway? How does that work? When you leave, does someone not automatically take over as captain? Yeah, as in position rather than rank, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I mean, there has to be a captain on the ship at yeah. some point. I guess so. Sulu's already gone, yes, he's in the shuttle, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Chekhov warns the Vulcan uh, that they're in breach of treaty and threatens consequences. He says the Klingons are on their way. Yeah, but this is laughed at. Yes, the Vulcan tells him he should beam down with his first officer, but Chekhov wants assurances first. Back in Nimbus 3, Spock and Kirk look at Paradise City through their uh, high-tech viewers, but... It's, I don't think it's Paradise City, I think it's a settlement outside the city. Is it? Okay. Yes, so they, they're going to steal the horses from the settlement so they can get to the city. Ah, right, yeah, because I had a problem with that, because okay. they said it's two hours away, and then very quickly we see now yeah. that they come over. And that's yeah. why they want to steal the horses. Ah, right, that makes more sense then, yeah. In any case, Kirk isn't happy that they are 1.2 hours away on, on foot. Yes, so they need a distraction to get these... Yeah, they, lookouts, I think they are. Yeah, so they see some horses in lookouts, which is obviously um, uh, what they're after. And then we have a really cringeworthy, cringeworthy, repulsive. That's a bit harsh. But maybe a bit harsh, but that's, I thought, ah, uh, no. We they use a, a semi-naked Ahura dancing on a hill as bait for the salivating um, lookouts, keeping guard on 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 on, on the city. Now, oh, I don't know where to begin with this. I don't want to be offensive, but. Which part of her did you find the most appealing? None of this. Uh, okay, she is in her... I don't want to be ageist either, because, you know, these days, I'm, I'm sure... What, Nicole Kidman and Sharon Stone are... You know, but, uh, sorry, Ahura, you're not these uh, these modern types. Um, I mean, Jennifer Lopez, yeah, she's, she's in her 50s, yeah? But, however, uh, this was this was horrible. She tries to dance seductively, and they all drool and, and, and rush over towards her. And to be fair, it's not, they've not got a clear, well-lit view. It's yeah. kind of a dark and... Well, all the more reason to go, wait a second, that could be anyone up there. Well, that could be the fact that anyone, even if it was someone very sexy, they'd be thinking, well, hang on. But you'd be, you'd be more the, suspicious. They'd be like, oh, rabid dogs. Blah, we need to get to this. I think that's the idea. This is the sort of person that they're dealing with. So I was thinking about this. And again, I, I don't want to be to be unkind. But we need to be honest. You do want to be unkind. Uh, well, sort, sort of. And this is, of course, only my personal opinion. Um... But, so we're thinking back, even at our, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't ever find Ahura in any way attractive, really. I can understand why some people might have. And I was wondering why. And I thought, and I've sort of briefly mentioned this to you, Ian, that there's, we talk about, you know, sort of timeless beauty. And that mm. could be either male or female. And the more I thought about it, so I never found Ahura or Rand or Chapel in the least bit attractive. Now, there are other ones who I've mentioned uh, um, Andrea and and and, and, and the robots, the robots, yeah. Uh, who I who looking back now, you still go, wow, they're still they're still hot, right? but not once I've ever thought Rand or or Ahura. No, no, there was that one episode when Ahura shot off her abs that was pretty impressive. No, 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 no. and and the reason is, and as like I say, it's, it's a sort of timeless beauty thing. So 
it's not sexist. If you look at Kirk, I, I, I still think there's the same issue with with, with uh, William Shatner. I don't think if you were to show any say twenty year old girl today or woman today a picture of William Shatner at his peak, right? I pretty much convinced no one would go, Wow, look at him, he's hot. However, if you to show perhaps a picture of a uh, um, James Dean mm -hmm. or a young Paul Newman or even a young Robert Redford, right? I can I can totally understand why uh, the maybe they're just your type. Yeah, well, maybe yeah, but I can see that they are, and and I think it's because for a start, like jo Joan Collins, she was really hot, and, and I think well, firstly, these are sort of Hollywood uh, movie actors. A, sort of a level up, Kirk, marketing, Kirk and all that are, are TV, and there's a reason for that. Marketing and, and no, I think what it is is they're not good looking enough. <laughs> they're, they're 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 not timeless. They're very much. Off, off their time and maybe to do with the styling and the hair style. Rand for example that hair you look at it and you go no it's too old fashioned same with Kirk um, and I even thought more about it as well you look at back at the Beatles right and mm -hmm. you see all those young teenage girls swinging over fucking Paul McCartney and John Lennon right if you look at those people individually now and you show them if they weren't the Beatles you should, even if they are the Beatles you show them to any equivalent 15 year old girl they would laugh and go what they're not good looking they're not like compare that to your justin bieber or whoever it is that the the girls all all fancy these days right you're at least 10 years out here. probably yeah but you get my point right these sort of guys dressed in that and their, their stupid hair they wouldn't be found attractive they're not timeless but if you look even at the same time i would suggest that um mick jagger you could now for a lot of people mick jagger maybe they don't find him attract attractive but he's got a look that he, i could totally see People, girls or guys who are, are, are into, into guys, uh, you could look at and go, yeah, Jagger's still a good looking guy. Paul McCartney's not a good looking guy. John Lennon's not a good looking, fucking Ringo, we know for sure, isn't a good looking guy. Because they're very much off their time. And I think, I went off on a little rant here, but yeah. I think that there are certain people who would be classed as timelessly good looking and stylish and attractive. Others who were that sort of 60s and, and, and Ahura and Rand and Chapel are very much of the time and would not pass muster today. The other people who you go, wow, you're still hot, be it male or female, and that's me. Just not attractive. <laughs> so, sorry, Ahura, you're apparently, you're trying to be sexy dancing, just give me a wee bit of the... A couple of bits of trivia about this dance. Right, go for it. Apparently the uh, guy who wrote the screenplay suggested it as a joke and was surprised that it was approved. Yeah. Secondly, Nichelle Nichols was very unhappy that her vocals were overdubbed. I wouldn't be unhappy uh, at the least of my concerns. So she was obviously happy enough with her physical performance. Mm -hmm. As was the director. Yeah, Shatner. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, anyway, it works. Apparently, it works. So apparently, yeah, your, they all your uh, theories wrong. Yeah, they all drool and rush towards her. But when they arrive, they of course, find themselves uh, facing down the barrels of a couple of phasers. The setup. Yep. So the Kirk and Co get the horses and we see them ride on into town. And yeah. they're allowed in because the people in the gates obviously assume it's the lookouts coming in. Of course. And did you like the little bit of advice Kirk gave Spock? What was that? Be at one with the horse. Ooh. And as we know, and as we have discussed, uh, Shatner is a big horseman. Yes, but Leonard and I also had training and was a bit, I think, patronised by the horse riding advice the director tried to give him. <laughs> okay. In this. Although I think George Decay found the horse riding very difficult. Yeah, from his own comments. My favourite actual moment of the movie is in this scene. What happens when Spock gives the Vulcan nerve pinch to a horse? Yes, <laughs> and it collapses. <laughs> and again, that that there's a, a a sort of nod towards Blazing Saddles. Okay. If you've not seen it, there's a guy, big brute of a guy, mm -hmm. um, who knocks out a horse. Right, that sounds cruel. That is cruel, yeah. But I mean, it's obviously not real. But yeah, he punches a horse uh, unconscious. So this is very similar. Right, like the violence, obviously. Fair enough. There was Blazing Saddles before this? 73 I think, Blazing Saddles, yeah. Okay. So yeah, well before this. Yeah. Okay. I've actually just uh, finished uh, listening to Mel Brooks' autobiography. Right. Very good. Funny man. Very funny man, yeah. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of his films, but I understand why people find them funny. Surely a lot of people who like Star Trek and Star Wars and all would have be, be fans of Spaceballs. You would think. Yeah. Although... Unless they feel they've been patronised. I don't think so. Yeah. He says in his book, anyway, he only uh, spoofs genres that he, he appreciates. Yeah. I mean, a lot of folk who love Star Trek love Galaxy Quest. I hated it. Right. I watched it. Nah. Sigourney Weaver, yeah. And, uh, and Alan Rickman and Tim, Tim Allen. Tim Allen, yeah. Yeah, so they, they play a set of actors who play yeah. 
Starship crew and then they get into a real... I think Tim Allen puts me off, to be fair. Yeah, puts a lot of people off a lot yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, he, Kirk signals to Uhura to bring the shuttle in. He thinks everything is clear, the way is clear, and they head into the bar where the three-breasted cat lady launches herself at Kirk. <laughs> yeah, and he has to uh, beat her by throwing her into a fish tank. Yeah, cats hate water. Ah, right, uh, yes, it's okay. Interesting that her makeup and outfit took six hours and she appears on screen for less than a minute. There you go, that's Hollywood for you. Anyway, Spock joins him and so do the three hostages. Yes, and we think, here we go, the big rescue, but ah. they do not want rescued. No, this is the, the big car, one of the first reveals. Yes, they've been turned to the way of the Vulcan and it is now the Enterprise crew who are the hostages. Outside, the gang are led back uh, into a, a jeering mob as the leader congratulates his men and, on a job well done. They are then faced with this leader and we discover Spock knows him fairly well. Spock, it's me, it's Cybok. After all these years, you finally caught up with me. Don't you have anything to say to me? You are under arrest for 17 violations of the Neutral Zone Treaty. <laughs> Spock! You've developed a sense of humor after all. It was not my intention to amuse you. These are serious charges. However, if you surrender now... I'm sorry, Spock. I can't surrender now. I'm not through violating neutral zone treaty. <laughs> In fact, I'm just getting started. And for my next violation, I intend to steal something. Something very big! <laughs> I must have your starship. You staged all this to get your hands on my ship. Who are you? James T. Kirk, captain of the Enterprise. But I thought Captain Chekhov. I see. Very clever, Captain. Spock, it would appear that you've been given a second chance to join me. What do you say? I am a Starfleet officer. Of course. Of course. Then I'll take the ship without your help. <laughs> Up on the Enterprise Bridge, Scotty notes the shuttle is en route, unaware of any difficulties, but also that the Klingons are closing on their position. Yeah, and we see them turn on cloaking. Yes, there are only a few thousand Kelicans. Oh, yeah, again, we don't know what that is. So Chekhov raises shields and goes to red alert, even though the shuttle containing Kirk, McCoy and Spock, as well as Sulu, and the, the three baddies, is approaching. Well, yes, because the Klingons have cloaked and are likely to attack. On the Galileo, Chekhov communicates through and, and tells them what is happening and to find safe harbour for the moment, so don't try and try and dock. Yeah, but Cybok says no. They have to continue. Kirk explains to him that it will take 15 and a half seconds to dock, which Spock confirms precisely, uh, during which time the shields will be, need to be down and the Enterprise will be vulnerable to attack, which Kord is able to confirm to Cybok. And so Cybok agrees that Kirk can do what he must, and they all watch as he tells Chekhov that they are going for emergency landing plan B. It is remarkable that he has now got no codes that he can use. He's used many times coded messages to explain that they're in trouble. Yep. What is plan B? Well, nobody seems to know, but it's uh, basically to let Sulu fly in without the tractor beam at full speed. This seems crazy, especially when Sulu concedes it'll be the first time for him trying it. <laughs> yes. And the Klingons target the shuttle, having learned now from that communication that Kirk's on board, but they're too late. Yeah, well, the, the Klingons are now decloaked and poised to take a shot. So Scotty lowers the shields and they make a run for it. Yeah, Sulu clips the hull as he brings the shuttle in, but the safety net in the docking bay catches them yeah. and everyone seems to be fine and they zoom off at warp speed. Yeah. 
a little bit later on the Galileo, Cybok is the first to rise after the crash landing and points his weapon at Kirk and demands the, the, the course is changed. Yes, Kirk says he'll take him to the bridge, but when the two of them step off the shuttle, he turns on his captor. And a fight ensues. Spock ends up pointing the weapon at Cybok and tells him to surrender. But he says no and tells Spock, if you have to, kill me. Yes, he seems to know that Spock won't do that and he's able to disarm him. Well, here's the thing, yeah. Spock hesitates and Kirk screams for him to do it. Now, I, I'm not sure why. Sure, that's a last resort. Cybok's not... You don't need to kill him right now. Shoot him in the leg or... or disable him in some some, way. something else. It's like, you must kill him right now. No, 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 no. He's not. He's only asking to be taken somewhere else. He's not endangering yep, everyone, right. everyone else's life. It was Fair a very enough. extreme reaction, I thought. But anyway, he is devastated when Spock can't do this. And this allows Cybok to easily take the weapon from him. Yes, and regain control of the situation. Yeah. I think he says to Sp Spock, oh, I thought you, you might actually do it for a second there. He does, but then he offers Spock the opportunity to join him on the bridge, which Spock once again turns down. Yeah, so he has to go to the brig with Kirk. McCoy is then led out, and Cybok tells his uh, men to put him in the, the brig with the other two. Yes, but Sulu and Uhura are being taken separately, and we see also Scotty watching them from some kind of viewing platform. Yeah, I think uh, Cybok asks for a moment alone with Sulu and uh, Ahura. He does. In the brig. Kirk is still a raging at Spock for oh, his... It's only moments later. Yeah, sure. For, for this so-called betrayal and not pulling the trigger. Yes, Spock's upset that he has not only betrayed the crew, but Kirk himself. But he explains that Cybok is literally his brother. Yeah. He also says that he'd be happy to put on his ass if it would, uh, if it would uh, please Kirk. Yeah. Did uh, this reveal uh, surprise you? Stun you? Um, I, no, because... Irritate I, you? <laughs> yeah. so it's a little bit contrived, isn't it? He's not mentioned brothers before, all of a sudden they're throwing this in. Yeah, to I, the, I think William Shatter was opposed to it as well. And at least uh, it was half-brother, it wasn't full-on brother-brother. Yeah, I think even Leonard Nimoy was opposed to it. I think they thought it was soap opera-y. Yeah, I think so, yeah. But it was forced upon them. Yeah. Uh, nobody ever mentioned Cyborg again. Maybe at the end of this it'll all be a dream. No, well, he just doesn't get mentioned again. Okay. Yeah, Kirk doesn't initially want to believe him, uh, but Spock explains that it's his, uh, his half-brother. Yes, and he doesn't talk about personal matters, and that's why he's never brought it up before. Yeah. Uh, we find it a little bit more. Uh, Cybok's mother was a, a Vulcan princess, and when she died, they were both raised together as brothers, but hadn't mentioned it, as you say, because it was a, a personal matter. Which, <clears throat> yeah. So that suggests that he Cybok's older and was living with his mother, at the point that Sarek and Amanda had Spock. Yeah. And then the mother died. Yeah. So Cybok then came to live with Spock, Sarek, Amanda, and presumably Michael, who you've not heard about. But that's another Mick? reveal later on. Okay. His sister, Michael. What's uh, Spock's surname again? You can't pronounce it. Oh, can you not? No. It doesn't come up. Right. Audibly. Hmm. Son of Sarek. Kirk still isn't happy, but McCoy defends Spock and insists that he couldn't kill his own brother. And in any case, they've got bigger concerns to, to deal with, such as escaping. Indeed. Up on the bridge, an apparently brainwashed Sulu and Uhura arrive, and Sulu sets a new course while Cybok sets off to brainwash Chekhov. Yeah. There's a nice shot now from above the brig as Kirk fiddles with a roof panel and electrocutes himself. Yeah, yeah they're looking for a, a means of escape. Spock points out it's escape proof as he was the subject they used to test it. Yeah, well, it was tested on uh, the most intelligent person the designers could find. <laughs> <laughs> He's basically taunting the other two at this point. <laughs> Back in the bridge, Chekhov seems to be uh, with Cyborg now as he has plotted the new course with an arrival time of under seven hours. Cyborg then decides to communicate with the rest of the ship to let them know of his intentions. He starts by asking them to consider the, the questions of existence and notes his Vulcan ancestors were ruled by emotions and believed in a place where all questions could be answered. He goes on to state that modern dogma claims the place to be a myth but he insists it is no fantasy and together they can prove it. It exists. My brothers. We have been chosen. To undertake the greatest adventure of all time. 
the discovery of Shakari. Is it possible? Is what possible? That he's found Shakari. The reason Cyborg left Vulcan. Our destination is the planet Shakari, which lies beyond the Great Barrier. At the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy, where Shakari is fabled to exist. The center of the galaxy can't be reached. No ship has ever gone into the Great Barrier. No probe has ever returned. Cyborg possessed the keenest intellect I have ever known. Spock, my only concern is getting the ship back. When that's done and Cyborg is in here, then you can debate Shakari until you're green in the face. Uh, until then, you're either with me or you're not. I am here, Captain. That's a little vague, Spock. What's that noise? It is a primitive form of communication known as Morse code. You're right. I'm in a lot of practice. Uh, that's an S. A T. A. N. Uh, D. End of word. Stand. New word. B. A. Um, C. K. Back. Stand back. Stand, Stand back! <laughs> Here, Scotty. This is a jailbreak. As Scotty's arrived, he blows a hole in the back of this brig mm-hmm. cell and they leave through it. And up in a corridor, Cybok is telling Sulu that the bond between the three prisoners is strong and difficult to penetrate. I think they're on their way to speak to them. Yeah. It's interesting, you won't know, but the corridors here are very next generation aesthetic and there's a reason for that, which we'll come to uh, later on. Okay. In a uh, tube, Jeffrey's tube I guess, Scotty directs Kirk, Spock and McCoy to the turbo shaft where they can climb to the forward observation deck that we saw earlier on with the big ships wheeling it. Yeah, I think there's a, an emergency sending machine up there. Yeah, some kind of way to communicate, yes. And uh, Scotty thinks they can reach this through the, the turbo shaft three. Yeah. So Kirk tells Scotty to get uh, the transporter working and to contact a rescue ship as he McCoy and Spock head for this shaft after receiving directions from Scotty. Kirk tells him that he is amazing, but as he walks off, he mumbles to himself that it's not amazing, he simply knows the ship like the back of his hand before doing what? Walking straight into a bulkhead. Now this is a sort of humour that he, it's just, it oversteps the mark and becomes... It's a bit Tom and Jerry, isn't it? It is very much. I, I was expecting some sort of uh, sound effect to, yeah. to come out and a laugh track. On the other hand, it does at least lead to a significant injury that we see later on. It's not just written off as a joke. Yeah. That's the only saving grace. It is. It's got his deserved a good smack to the head for a a lot of things over the the years anyway, so I'm not really feeling sorry for him. Maybe this will cure his hatred of women. Could do, yes. (laughs) In the shaft, meanwhile, uh, Kirk and McCoy begin to climb and don't realise that Spock has sneaked away. Yeah, they are struggling but progressing. When Kirk stops to ask where Spock is and is answered immediately as the man himself floats down from above in his hover boots. That we saw at the side of the mountain. Yeah, it was quite there. nice working that back in there. Yeah, nice connection. Uh, we had a wee cutaway in the middle of that for Sulu to find Scotty and have him taken to sickbay. Yeah. The other two then nervously hold on, but apparently the weight of them is too great. And they start to drop towards Sulu and Cybok's men who are waiting beneath. So what does Spock do? He engages the boosters. Yeah, he fires his rockets which shoots them up at great speed. They nearly crash into the ceiling but eventually get off at the correct level. And we find ourselves in the observation room. They do. Kirk puts out a distress call but is duped by the, the woman on the Klingon ship who pretends to be Starfleet. That's just a very elementary error for someone like Kirk to make. I'd have thought so, yeah. Just then, Cybok and his gang enter, and he calmly states that they only fear the unknown. He talks about man's achievements in understanding and overcoming things that had previously been thought impossible. Yes, so Kirk agrees to hear him out, and Cybok has his men wait out in the corridor. What do we hear about? There's a great barrier, apparently, that they're heading towards uh, in the centre of the galaxy, which we see the Klingons over here and follow also. Apparently this is the ultimate expression of fear and tells Kirk he wants his respect and asks 
if he's afraid to hear him out. But Alpha Kirk states he's afraid of nothing. And so Cybok tells his men, to, as you say, to wait outside and then says to Kirk that they will be able to answer all their questions together. Indeed. We head down to sickbay. Yes, Scotty wakes up and he's quite anxious to tell Uhura what's going on with Cybok. I think he said he had a, a strange dream that a, a madman had taken over the ship. But Uhura calms him, saying it's not a madman. He's just someone who's put them in touch with the feelings that they've been afraid to express. Scotty's not the type, I don't think, who wants to be in touch with his, uh, his, his hidden feelings. No. He's more old school. He is. He wants to hide his feelings with whiskey. Exactly. And violence. Towards women. <laughs> you mentioned that a moment ago, but um, did that not happen in the infamous episode where he became a, a serial killer? Was it not caused by a bang in the head? Yes, that's why I said. Yeah. Yeah, this might cure it. Or just make it worse. Well, yes. That's entirely possible. But if cartoons have taught us anything, it's that yeah. a bang in the head can only be cured by a Another bang equal and opposite bang on the head. Anyhow, Uhura won't allow Scotty to get to the transporters where he wants to go. She wants to tell him more, but he now turns the table slightly. What does he say? He explains that he's not in the best of conditions and please could you wait till he's a bit stronger. In the observation room, Cybok is explaining what Shakari is. It's a heaven, an Eden, the source, whatever a culture wants to call it. And apparently, it will soon be a reality for all of them. So he is just the same as the guy from The Way to Eden. Yeah. He says also that he doesn't control minds, he just frees them. Mm. Kirk is not convinced, understandably, and says that the only reality he has is of being a prisoner on his own ship and asks about yeah this, this power to control minds. McCoy wants to know how it's done and Cybok says that he recognises in him the deepest pain of all. But McCoy thinks this is very similar to brainwashing. However, it's clear that the message has had some sort of effect on him. I think he's starting to... Well, he allows Cybok to give it a go anyway. How does Cybok demonstrate this understanding, this empathy? He recreates a moment of pain from McCoy's past. I quite liked the next few moments. It was... Um... It was quite sincere, it was quite touching, it was quite emotional. Yeah, you can understand why it would have the releasing sort of impact that Cybok's going for. Yeah. What do we see or what do we all witness together? Yeah, so together, and I think this includes Spock and Kirk, uh, they witness McCoy reliving essentially a moment from his past. The death, the deathbed of his father. Yeah, well essentially he euthanizes his father who is suffering from something terminal and painful. Yeah, his dad is begging him to, to end it all, to stop the, the, the pain. And at first, I think, McCoy is hesitant. He's reticent to do so. You know, yeah. He's upholding his... Yeah, but, but his, his pain is such because with all his training and all his skills, he can't help his father. And he's, he thinks, what was the point of me becoming a doctor mm -hmm. if I can't help the people I care about? It's a, it's, a, it's a decent message to be, or a theme to be discussing in the, episode, in the, in the movie, I thought. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's quite interesting, just to segue slightly, um, so we're talking about Cybok as being a Vulcan who's embraced emotion, but he's not obviously succumbed entirely to emotion, he's not wild or savage, he's able to combine some of the powers that we see Spock use, but also use them in a different way, so this presumably is something that Vulcans would have the capacity to do, but they choose not to do it because exploring emotions isn't something that they have any interest in. Yeah, I think it's a conscious decision that they have to make. Yes. But it's not that this isn't, the, what he's doing here with McCoy isn't some kind of bizarre leap and saying, oh, well, we need a Vulcan to do something, we'll just give him a new power. It seems like a natural progression from what we've seen Spock do in the past. It looks like it, yeah. Anyhow, um, Cybok asks McCoy to go deeper and explain why the pain is worse than he's letting on. <laughs> yeah, this is unfortunate. He tells him that it's because that not long after he um he killed his his father they um they found a cure for whatever ailment he had <laughs> <laughs> that that is unfortunate and it's but it almost comes off as comedic when he says it, it. it does and i'm not sure how relevant it was i mean he's obviously a very old man and it's it's all very well you know curing one particular aspect of an illness but when you get 
to that age when you get so old something's going to get you it's only a case of you know putting your finger in the in the dam yeah it's also it seems unusual that mccoy being a medical expert knowing the condition his father has wouldn't be up to speed with research yeah it's not like it's not like a eureka moment where all of a sudden they have a cure they yeah, go from nothing they, to cure yeah. yeah you know this is likely to be on the horizon on the cards or being trialed somewhere yeah, yeah. anyhow cyborg tells him to release his pain and he moves on to spock well, firstly, he goes to Kirk and Spock and he states that each man's pain is unique. But Spock, he's quite adamant that he hides nothing. And I think this is taken as a, a challenge of sorts by Cyborg. Yes, and Cyborg makes a mistake here, but we don't find out about that until a wee bit later on. Okay. So he shows Spock the moment of his birth. That's not, you never really want to see that, do you? Where he is rejected by his father, who refers to him as so human. Yeah, it's, it's almost like there's a, you can see the disappointment in his father's Yeah, yeah and I think what Cyborg is trying to um, hone in on here is a sense of unbelonging mm -hmm. that Spock has. For um, sure. The fact that he doesn't fit in on Vulcan, he doesn't fit in on Earth. Yeah. But... Um, it must be similar to in certain cultures at certain times where perhaps the, the, the male child was seen to be preferential and, you know, if you were, oh, it's a, it's a girl, okay, fair enough. Yeah, maybe. Not really what we're looking for. Let's try again. <laughs> Keep going, Henry VIII said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, Cyborg thinks he's got through to Spock, but I suspect he has not. You don't think so? I mean, for me, Spock turns in a bit of a daze. And at this point, Kirk demands to know what is going on. What have you done to my friends? I've done nothing. This is who they are. Didn't you know that? No, I didn't. Now learn something about yourself. No, I refuse. Jim, try to be open about this. About what? That I've made the wrong choices in my life? That I turned left when I should have turned right? I know what my weaknesses are. I don't need Cyborg to take me on a tour of them. If you just unbend and all... And be brainwashed by this con man! I was wrong. This con man took away my pain. Damn it, Bones, you're a doctor. You know that pain and guilt can't be taken away with a wave of a magic wand. They're the things we carry with us, the things that make us who we are. If we lose them, we lose ourselves. I don't want my pain taken away. I need my pain. Saiba, this is the bridge. We're in approach of the Great Barrier. Captain, I'm afraid you'll have to remain here. Spock, Dr. McCoy, come with me. Spock? I cannot go with you. Why not? I belong here. I don't understand. Sabok, you are my brother, but you do not know me. I am not the outcast boy you left behind those many years ago. Since that time, I have found myself and my place. I know who I am, and I cannot go with you. See? See what? It didn't work on Spock. <sighs> the pain that Cyborg thought Spock was carrying around, he wasn't anymore. He's found his home with his friends on the Enterprise. He belongs there. So that, he no longer has that pain. Well, I would agree that, that the pain wasn't sufficient to get him on board to change his mind. It doesn't mean to say that he's totally disregarded it. Well, he just said there. Right, what I'm he says. Now. Yeah, but he's not likely to say, the, I need some, you know, I'm not fine. The other interesting thing, though, is with McCoy and presumably the others, he finds their pain. So presumably he's not been able to do that with Spock and that's why he's had to assume he knew. Yeah, that's the point. What about, uh, did you like Kirk embracing his pain and he likes it, he it's wants it, he needs it? Yeah. yeah, I can tell what he's into. <laughs> anyway. Well, it would be a bit rubbish if everyone was walking around cheerful all the time with no concerns. Of course. McCoy also counts himself out and so Cybok goes to leave without them and says he will see them on the other side so he's obviously not holding a, a particular grudge here no he's not a villain no. of that type Kirk explains to Cybok that he's not going to make it through the barrier but Cybok says to him will that convince Kirk if they do and at this point um, he makes reference to a vision which kind of changes things a little bit yeah a vision given to him by God who apparently waits for them on the other side. That had major cult leader vibes, you know. It did. Although, as we'll find out later, it wasn't God, it was an evil alien. Okay. 
Kirk tells him he's mad and Cyborg says that they will see. This reminded me a bit of, you wouldn't have seen it, the Marvel movie, Shown to See, the one with the um, five, five, twelve rings, twelve rings. The Hobbit? It's a fairly recent one. No, it's a Marvel superhero. Oh, right. Lord of the Rings? There was voices telling folk that their loved ones are behind a wall and when they got there it was actually monsters. Oh, right, okay. It's, anyway, it's, a it's nothing to do with Lord of the Rings. I don't know what you're well, talking about. If keep, I don't know. On rings. the bridge of the Enterprise, Chekhov says there are no readings at all on their instruments as they pass through the barrier, or as they approach the barrier. Yeah, he's not sure if this barrier actually exists or not because of this. But Sulu is told to go uh, full ahead, and we see the Enterprise enter an electrified blue cloud-like entity. It like there's something under a microscope. Yeah. And at the same time, down in the, or up in the observation deck, our three prisoners are also watching on. It does seem as if it was actually pretty easy to get through. They don't have to do much. There was no resistance at all. Why has nobody ever tried? Yeah. So, oh, it's the centre. Oh, we can't go in there. It's just, that's oh, it, isn't it? It's just these, <laughs> just these myths or stories that are built up, like you can't go through there, you will die, it's so all better not then. I mean, they know that at the edge of the galaxy, there's a barrier that'll give them superpowers if they've got ESP. Mm, that's true. Maybe the centre's the same, they think, and they just never checked. They don't want superpowers. But it could also be that there's an illusion there created to make you believe that if this is a prison, as I will contend it is, people who created it maybe didn't want folk coming in and disturbing it. Possibly. So they get through anyway, and they see what looks like a, a planet. It looks like a gas planet. Sort. Yeah. But it's not. Down in the observation room, a stunned Kirk asks if it is actually possible. Well, Spock remarks... It's fascinating, and McCoy wants to know if they are all dreaming. Referring back to Row, Row, Row Your Boat, Kirk says that if they are dreaming, then life is indeed a dream. Mm, there we go. And at this point, the camera pans down to show what? Un underneath the ship's wheel, it says, I think, where no man has gone before. To boldly go where no man has gone before. That was a bit on the nose. Very much. So, up in the bridge. Yes, we go down a lineup of these console from the planet of Galactic Peace, who each give their own name for this vision this planet that they've found from what their species would call it and then kirk mccoy and spock are brought to the bridge and kirk's command is restored by cyborg yeah kirk's a bit surprised and asks why are you so sure i won't just turn back i think cyborg thinks no one could possibly refute his vision now yeah i think he's uh, confident that kirk is now a believer so he tells his crew he will do things by the book if he's going to do it at all that's yeah. what's going to happen he gives them all orders and tell Cyborg, Spock and McCoy to come with him to the shuttlecraft and to hurry up as God's a busy man. <laughs> I did enjoy him ordering uh, Sulu to enter standard orbit. We haven't heard that for nope. quite some time. Uh, in the shuttle, uh, we see the four men pass into the planet's atmosphere, which now looks like now looks like something under a microscope. So earlier on it looked like watery mm -hmm. stuff, but now you look like you're going through something microscopic, the quantum realm or something like sure. that. And Spock reports that someone's taking control of the shuttle. This pleases, or seems to please, Cyborg. Yeah, he grins, and they land in a, a dry-looking place surrounded by mountains and rocks. It reminded me a lot of the planet from the start of the film. Yeah, it reminds me a lot of most of the planets. I thought they were going to go and say, oh no, it's barren. <laughs> if we're wrong. Before they exit, Kirk reaches for a weapon. I mean, that's just typical human pattern isn't it or human action oh we better take a gun we might have to shoot people or kill safety kill. first here's the thing you're, you're, it's apparently you're going to meet a god i mean either it's not it's going to be total nonsense or it will be some sort of yeah, i'm not sure he's bringing a gun isn't cyborg know, stops him anyway he does yeah in, in, in fairness kirk doesn't put up much of a a, a fight so they step down uh, onto this uh, pink hued planet and cyborg seems unnaturally impressed by he's nothing more than rocks and desert he's elated yeah I'm, i'd be thinking this is a bit disappointing this yeah up on the bridge of the enterprise they're watching this but i don't understand where the shot's coming from because it includes no, no, both no, no. the shuttle and the people have you learned nothing <laughs> it's modern technology some kind of drone of course that's what it is they climb over uh the, the rocky mountains and from the bridge ahura urges scotty to watch but he's too busy fixing the transporter as he was instructed to do so and a lot of them are all so busy watching this trek that they don't notice their sensors 
reporting the approach of the Klingons. Well, that's it. They entirely neglect their duties. This isn't very professional at all. Very unprofessional. Mm -hmm. Back down on the planet, the three of them follow the very eager cyborg, but he seems a bit embarrassed when nothing appears to be waiting for them. Yeah, he seems... I, I, I've written disillusioned. It's almost as if there's no God here, there's no... there's nothing. It's all a bit awkward as he screams to the skies that they have travelled far and Kirk starts to communicate with the Enterprise, but he doesn't really know what to say. Yeah, Spock approaches Cybok apparently sympathetically, but just then the ground shakes and pillars of rock emerge around them. It looks like a bit of like a, a rib cage of a, a whale. Yes, a little bit like that. They form a, a near arch and look ceremonial, that's what I've said. Yeah, they tentatively proceed forwards before a, an immense stream of blue light shoots uh, from the ground and out past the atmosphere and past the Enterprise. It does, along with some blue dust wisping up and a voice which welcomes them. Yeah, a very deep voice with gravitas. Yeah, he welcomes the, the brave souls and McCoy, I think, here asks if, if it is God. I mean, you would assume that that's what yeah. they're there for. He says he has many faces and Cyborg goes in for a hug. Yeah, um, and he tells, he, he tells us this apparent God that they got there on a, a starship. I'm not sure why he would be asking about this or... Well... Hmm. God seems impressed and confirms that they are the first to reach him and then asks to use the starship to carry his knowledge beyond the barrier. Yeah, you would be getting suspicious at this point. Why would you need such a thing? Indeed. And obviously this doesn't sit right with the impertinent Kirk, who has some questions he wants answered. Excuse me. It will carry my power to every corner of creation. Excuse me, I'd just like to ask a question. What does God need with a starship? Bring the ship closer. I said, what does God need with a starship? Jim, what are you doing? I'm asking you a question. Who is this creature? Who am I? Don't you know? Aren't you God? He has his doubts. You doubt me? I seek proof. Jim, you don't ask the Almighty for his ID. Then here is the proof you see. Why is God angry? Why? Why have you done this to my friend? He doubts me. You've not answered his question. What does God need with a starship? Doubt any god who inflicts pain for his own pleasure. Stop! The god of Shakari would not do this. Shakari? A vision you created. I found it quite refreshing that the movie addressed the the, the well trodden question of, you know, what pe people who are obviously believers in God, about uh, their, their God, you know, causing pain and da damage and carnage and, and misery to people. So. Yeah. Yeah. He obviously not, isn't God. He goes on to say he's a prisoner. He's been prisoned here, imprisoned here for an, inter an eternity and he intends to escape. Yeah. He aggressively demands their ship. Spock calls out to Cybok that this is not the God he's looking for or any God for that matter. And Cyborg demands that he reveal himself. Who who actually are you? And so with a, a maniacal laugh, the vision of Cyborg himself appears in the eyes of the this being. And he tells him he has many appearances, but this suits him best. Now, at this point, I thought that what they were saying was this was the devil. It actually reminded me a little bit of uh, Sympathy for the Devil, the Rolling Stones song. <laughs> right. uh, some of the lines in that. Um, but you'd you don't think that's the case? No, I think this is more like, if you remember back to the episode And the Children Will Lead, mm. when they had the um, Jack Ruby's lawyer show up, yeah, as a similar sort of ethereal presence who had manipulated the children to bring the Enterprise 
so that he could get on board and escape his prison. I think it's something very similar to that. This is a creature that's been imprisoned on this planet. He's found a way to communicate with Cybok, who's obviously been looking for some sort of ethereal communication. And he has essentially brainwashed him into bringing a starship here to free him. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I'm a bit disappointed that they didn't fully explain what is going on here. And the reason why I tend to agree with you is that, well, as we see shortly, he gets killed by a phaser and I'm sure that, he, you know, you can't kill a devil with a phaser. No. Or a torpedo, whatever it was. Yeah, no. I wouldn't have thought so. Yeah. But I thought it would have been nice if it was the devil. Well, you know, that would be a, you know, you go looking for, for God and you find the devil. It would make more sense than just another alien. Yeah. But then that would be sort of trying to say that this is factual or that this actually exists. But they did a, they've already said that Apollo exists. Yeah. And things like that. So I, I don't know. Anyhow, after this request from Cybok to reveal himself, um, God, as we'll call him, says that they should bring the ship or he will destroy them. Horribly. Indeed. And Cybok says this is a result of his own vanity and arrogance and he asks for forgiveness. Spock tries to calm him down but realises that Cybok must do what he has to do and so they they touch hands in the, the, the Vulcan sign before Cybok turns to face the the beast again. Asks him to share his pain and advances into his light. At this point Kirk has Chekhov shoot God with a torpedo which causes the pillars to crumble. That happened to Apollo as well, yes. if you remember. And Kirk, Spock and McCoy are, are thrown into the air. Yes, at this point Uhura reports that she's lost the visual link and again nobody notices this Klingon ship approaching as it cloaks. Mm -hmm. They get up and manage to get to their shuttlecraft but they look ashen as they hear an ominous noise and then Spock informs them that the thrusters are not working. Yes, but Kirk is able to contact Scotty who has managed to repair the transporters. However, he's only able to beam two of them up That's and before <laughs> yeah, of course, and before they can argue, Spock and McCoy are brought onto the Enterprise and as soon as they arrive, they demand that Kirk join them. Yes, however, before that can happen, the Klingons launch their attack on the Enterprise. And so Kirk is left to deal with the situation on his own. He's also under attack. Yes, by this creature, this entity, this god. On the bridge, Kla, the Klingon captain, is brought on screen so that he can deliver his terms to Spock. What does he want? He wants Kirk, but Spock tells him that Kirk is not aboard. He doesn't believe this. But Spock correctly points out he's a Vulcan. He can't lie. So... Spock walks over to Cord, who's on the, the bridge with him. Yes, he's a senior figure in the clan that certainly outranks Kla. And he asks for, for help from him. However, he says that he's just a foolish old man. However, Spock... Gives him a verbal slap. He does. Demands that he try. Meanwhile, down on the planet, Kirk is climbing a rock as God keeps shooting at him and yelling. It's good to see that the practice at the beginning of the, the movie is paying off. Paying yes. off here, yes. Kirk He's performing multiple physical feats of excellence. Yeah, and he, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure how this creature can miss. miss. <laughs> it's really, he's just a, a he's man just, on not rocks. omnipotent. He's no. just really bad at shooting. Yeah. It looks like he is finally done for, but just as the, the fatal blow is about to be delivered. What happens? Well, we get a great shot of the bird of prey rising from behind the mountain. A little bit like um, Back to the Future 2. Yes. On top of the yes. roof. And it shoots God, killing him, and then turns its weapons on Kirk. But instead of dying, he is beamed on to the bird of prey. He is where Cord is in command and Kla issues a very emasculated apology. Yeah, go on. It's like a kid, doesn't it? Go on, see it. Sorry. Well, make no, sorry, make sure you mean it. Sound like you mean it. Yeah, it's then revealed that the gunner who pointed the guns at Kirk was none other than Spock. It was. And Kirk says that he thought he was going to die. And but Spock reassures him that that could not have happened because he was never alone. Yeah, that's just based on the assumption that what Kirk was talking about was actually correct. It's like, yeah. I will definitely die uh, well, I alone. Think it's just a turn of phrase, isn't it? He's reassuring yeah. him that. You know, they were looking out for him. They hadn't abandoned him. And Kirk is so happy, he wants to, they want to, he wants to embrace Spock. But he <laughs> Spock's says, like, not in front of the Klingons. <laughs> we'll do it later. <laughs> you can rent in my, <laughs> my quarters, bring a bottle. Yeah. Over on the Enterprise Forward Observation Lounge, the Klingons have uh, come over for a party. And Cord and Scotty are getting along nicely. Yeah, they are. Um, 
There's a little uh, a soiree as the Klingon agrees with Sinjin and Dar that they have come a long way in their, their very short time. And then it's uh, Sulu and Chekhov, they enter uh, following the, the muscular, the large... He's talking about her muscles. Yeah, and they yeah. say, oh, that's really nice. I think there are a couple of fetishists. I'm sure she can hear them as well. Yeah, she likes it. Yeah. There are a couple of cuckolds, uh, what you call it these <laughs> days, uh, they're going for a bit of a pegging. <laughs> McCoy uh, tells Kirk... He was wondering whether, oh sorry, well, sorry, Kirk approaches McCoy and Spock. Yeah, also uh, Kla, who's across the other side of the room, gives uh, Kirk a little sort of chest pump. Uh, yeah, sign uh, as sign of respect, you. yes. Yeah. And Kirk approaches, as I say, McCoy and Spock and asks them what they're thinking about. But yeah, they say they're speculating about whether God is really out there and Kirk suggests that maybe... God lives in all of us. Well, no, he doesn't say that. No, that's, I've got a point here. He says that maybe it... Um, is within them and, and the human heart. It actually says the word human. Yeah. So it's like, well, Spock's not got a human heart and, and none of these other races have got human hearts no, either. He doesn't believe in God, so he's just saying, you know, you've got your fictional God and your fictional heart. Right. And I've got mine and mine. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, Spock sighs as he admits that he is thinking of the brother that he has lost. And then we get the most shocking line in the movie. Okay, tell me. Kirk says he also lost a brother once, but was lucky enough to get him back. Yeah, what, what was your problem with that line? He actually had a brother who died in season one. We uh, saw him. <laughs> William Shatner played him with yeah, the moustache. Yes. <laughs> I'll forget about that. <laughs> it's like the uh, the other brother from uh, the Cunningham's in Happy Days. We don't talk about him. He's, he's upstairs. He's, he's, just, never yeah, seen him again. he's playing his records. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes. So yes, it's a, a nice emotional moment as he refers to Spock as his brother. And then McCoy questions him by saying that he thought Kirk believed men like them don't have families. But after a brief pause, Kirk admits he was wrong. Indeed. And mm -hmm. then they go back on holiday. Yeah, back to the campsite where they resume their shore leave and their uh, their singing. I think Spock has a, a harp. A oh, lyre or something, yes. We, yeah. we saw him playing that back in the original series. Yes. For uh, Uhura, I remember. Yeah. I didn't enjoy that uh, singing by no, Uhura either. And did you enjoy this singing with these three guys in the round? No, nah, not really, no. Yeah. So they, they, they give us a bit of the old uh, row, row, row your boat. So Spock's obviously decided to try and embrace it to get into yeah. the spirit of, of, of camping eat his marshmallows yeah and that's the end it is did you enjoy it? yeah I, I, th I thought it was really good I heard the, the reputation was it was pretty dreadful and it's uh, yeah, the special it, effects are bad but yeah the story's fine absolutely fine it's always good to spend time with the character yeah. and I enjoyed it mm -hmm. but I, I think as I said during the, the, the podcast I thought they did go a little bit too far with the um, comedic elements i thought mm -hmm. they tried to push it it became a little bit silly especially the scotty bulkhead thing that yeah yeah did you like the next generation style corridors and doors no idea what you're talking about well they're completely different from the previous ones yeah okay but yeah but it's just because you said next generation style as if i would i don't have a well, point of reference here. we'll come back to it yeah in the um yeah they were fine anything you thought didn't work apart from the comedy you happy with cyborg being spock's brother a little bit contrived obviously but didn't great too much but I think you can just about get away with it because of the um, the, the Vulcan attitude where you might not talk about it. So it is believable that you yeah. would mention these things. When we get to Discovery, they introduce a new sister for him as well. Really? Yeah, that's An adopted that. sister who he grew up with. Mm. Okay. Indeed. Well, when you say when we get there, we won't be getting there. Well, I mean, if you yeah. personally in your own time right, go watch okay. this. Then. How do you think this movie sits with the other ones? Because obviously the last three were a trilogy, essentially, and then this... Yeah, it stands alone. And you can tell that it's a. Uh, but it's built upon what's happened in the previous ones, I think, to a certain extent. Give me a couple of examples then. What do you mean? Well, the references to Spock having been dead, for example. Mm. And that's, just a re that's just a, a reference. I isn't think it? the relationship between the three leads is different in the movies and it's developed across the movies as opposed to in the series when it was more. I'm not sure what the, the phrase is, but it, it was different. Yeah, well, I think that's something we can perhaps chat about during the, the final, right. final wrap up. <laughs> In a couple of weeks. In a couple of weeks' time, yeah. Okay, should we go on some trivia? Are you got any more thoughts? Um, who was Savic this week? Having her baby on Vulcan, I guess. Okay. Fine. You miss her? Not really. No. This was originally released in June of 1989, when I was just a, a youngin and you were probably at high school. What? Wasn't. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> William Shatner got to direct the movie and received a story credit. We talked about his career back in the podcast for the Tholian Web in season three. You can hear more about him there. And Harve Bennett 
also gets a story credit and a production credit. We discussed him in more depth in the podcast for The Wrath of Khan. David Laurie, or Lowry, is credited for both the story and the screenplay. This was his only work on Star Trek, but he also wrote for TV shows like Heart to Heart and Time Tracks, as well as movies like The Intruder. He remains active. Lawrence Luckinbill. Oh, no, it's a familiar name. Indeed, he played Cyborg. This was his only Star Trek role, but he also appeared in four Murder She Wrote's. He was in the movie Cocktail and an episode of Columbo. I remember him very well. Make Me a Perfect Murder. Yep. But his screen career did not continue past the mid 90s. Why not? I suspect a lot more stage work. Yeah. He did win a Primetime Emmy for his production skills on Lucy and Desi, a home movie in 1994. And interestingly, we already talked about his family, didn't we, in the during the episode? Or did I just no. do that off? Tape? That must have been off mic. Okay. And interestingly, his mother-in-law was Lucille Ball, who is largely responsible for Star Trek being commissioned in the 60s. And not only that, he is the uncle of Lana and Lily Wachowski, or Wachowski, who Matrix. did the Matrix movies. There you go. He's a sprightly 87 years young. Still going strong. We hope by the time this comes out, that's still the case. David Warner, that's a familiar face. Yeah, I know him most from actually, um, unless I'm mistaken here, uh, the Robert Powell version of the 39 Steps from 1979. That's not on my list, I'm sure he might have been in that. Okay. He played the Federation Envoy St John Talbot, but he goes on to portray more familiar or more iconic characters in the next movie and then in the next generation. Right. Different characters each time. Um, he's in the two-parter Chain of Command, he plays um, a Cardassian interrogator Kim we're not going to get into this he's also appeared in Murder She Wrote Babylon 5 he's obviously in Titanic you'll rec recognise him from I won't, the I've movie. not seen Titanic yeah, so. uh, he's been in three different films that had uh, the Titanic going down in them he's also won a primetime Emmy for his work on Masada in 1981 and was the original choice to play Freddy Krueger in the first Nightmare on Elm Street unfortunately scheduling conflicts forced him to drop out and Robert England took on the role ah well He's now 80 years old and he is still active. Charles Cooper played the Klingon console Cord. He'd go on to play a different Klingon character in two episodes of The Next Generation. He also appeared on shows like Dallas and Wagon Train, as well as films like The Wrong Man and Blind Fury. And he died in 2013 at the age of 87. Cynthia Gow played the Romulan consul Kathleen Dar. This was her only Star Trek role and her on-screen acting career ended after she earned her law degree in 1991. I think she may have done some journalism after that. She had a handful of other roles, including one guest appearance on Matlock, and she's now 58 years old. Todd Bryant played the impetuous Klingon Captain Kla, went on to appear in Star Trek VI before performing stunts for Star Trek Nemesis, the 10th Star Trek film. He worked on stunts for shows like TJ Hooker, Friends and 24, and has made acting appearances in programmes like Baywatch and Murder, She Wrote, and he is also 58 years old and still active. Space Williams played what? The, what, what? Space Williams. Space Williams. Played the Klingon executive officer Vixis, the female officer. Yes. She's another who has performed extensive stunt work as well as to, uh, taking on acting roles. She's married to the grandson of Bing Crosby. Oh, that's good. So she now goes by Space Williams Crosby. <laughs> she would go on to appear in one episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine and perform stunts for another. And she's appeared in shows like Buffy and Seinfeld, as well as films like From Dusk Till Dawn and Killing Hasselhoff. She's now 69 years old. She didn't look like a stunt person. <laughs> George Murdoch played God, or not God, depending on how you look at it. He would return to Star Trek in the classic Next Generation two-parter Best of Both Worlds as an admiral. He's also appeared on shows like Ellie Law, TJ Hooker, Knight Rider and Murder, She Wrote, as well as films like Orange County and Man in the Chair. He died in 2012 at the age of 81. Bill Quinn played McCoy's father in his final on stage, oh sorry, on screen acting role. He'd previously appeared in shows like The Golden Girls, Dallas, and Little House on the Prairie, as well as the Twilight Zone movie and The Reluctant Astronaut. He died in 1994 at the age of 81. A couple more minor Columbo connections in the movie. Sure. Ilona Wilson played a bar patron on Nimbus 3 in the Planet of Galactic Peace. She'd previously portrayed Lady by Pool. In Columbo Goes to the Guillotine. Okay. And Kenny Bates worked on stunts for A Bird in the Hand. There's at least one explosion in that film. Yeah, with Tyne Daly. Yes. In this movie, he set a record, which I think is still a record, for the highest descender fall. 
he did the long shots for Kirk falling off the cliff and it was the longest free fall for a stunt that's been recorded. Right, I mean these days you wouldn't need to actually do that. No, yeah, so it'll never get beaten. <laughs> <laughs> Some trivia, uh, many issues with production as we've kind of talked about briefly, not least that the special effects company Industrial Light and Magic who'd worked on the most recent three movies were unavailable because they were busy with Ghostbusters 2 and Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. <sighs> Which led to William Shatner finding a very cheap company that didn't do a good job. Oh. And he was not allowed extra money to get it resolved afterwards. Ah, well. Indy also robbed the film of William Shatner's first choice for the role of Cyborg, Sean Connery. The planet uh, Shakari is a play on the name Sean Connery, apparently. Really? So they say. Mm. Some folks say it's a play in Shangri-La, but it sounds yeah. more like Sean Connery. Okay. There was an, originally an entirely different final act with the planet being home to some rock monsters who pursued the group but it was abandoned after first <laughs> budget cuts reduced them to having one rock monster and secondly the effects that were done for it were terrible so they couldn't use it. It was replaced by the vision of God instead. William Shatner actually objected to many of the cuts that were made to bring the runtime down below two hours down to one hour 45. Had to haggle for some things he wanted to, to save. Although George Takei, DeForest Kelly and Leonard Nimoy have all commented on um, how much they appreciated his direction, I think Takei said he did a great job of not allowing the production problems to affect the people on set and they were all very pleased with his directing. First time I've heard Takei say something nice. I think he actually couched in, you know, I don't like him but... but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the film was produced during filming of the second season of Star Trek The Next Generation with many shared sets including the corridors that we talked about. And it was released between the air dates of season 2, episode 18, and season 2, episode 19 of that series. Next time, we're going to look at the sixth and final original series feature film Star Trek VI The Undiscovered Country, which is a Klingon heavy finale to the series. I shall look forward to that. So, until then, cheerio. Bye bye.